Hey everybody, welcome to Pop Culture Philosophers. I'm Rockin' Robbie Billups, and it's time for the weekly comic book review. That's right, everybody. Thanks for checking out the video. I am Rockin' Robbie Billups. This is the weekly comic book review. It's the show where I read a lot of comic books, and I'll let you know what I thought about them, and we always start with the pick of the week. This week's pick of the week, House of X, number one, the long-awaited restructuring of the X universe by writer Jonathan Hickman is finally here. It starts this week with House of X number one. This was a brilliant issue. I loved it. Exactly what you come to expect from Hickman. A, a story, a concept that's epic in scope, that's huge in scale. Fantastic. I really loved it. Pepe Larraz's artwork is absolutely masterful. It's elegant. It glides you right across the page. Marte Gracia on the coloring. Tom Mueller on design work. Clayton Cowles on the lettering. This is a pitch-perfect team working in pitch-perfect concert with one another and really unveiling this new vision of Jonathan Hickman on the X universe, right? I feel like the X Men universe have really needed some restructuring here for a while. We've had some false starts and some false hopes here and there over the last few years, but I genuinely have not been this excited about the X-Men books since Grant Morrison's new X-Men. I was a huge fan of that run, and I'm a huge fan of this one. This one starts huge and big and different, and already the world is instantaneously changed by the time you open the first page of House of X. It's a great place for mutants. It's a great setup for many stories to come. We've had those announcements this weekend at San Diego Comic-Con of Hickman leading a whole bunch of creators out there um, with the post-House of X, post-Powers of Ten world. So House of X, Powers of Ten, which starts next week, two six-issue miniseries that are going to kind of alternate back and forth, one telling the new status quo for mutants in the Marvel Universe, and one telling the untold history. That's Powers of Ten. House of X, though, is great. I was not knowing... I just didn't know what to expect, you know? If you are familiar with Hickman, you're gonna be familiar with his work in this one, right? It's, like I said, epic in scope. It's got this great sense of, of thought behind it, like it's a whole world that's been built up, no detail left unturned, lots of charts, maps, graphs little sidebars and things like that. Really super cool stuff, right? And that's why Tom Mueller does a great job helping design this book. Hickman always brings a lot of flair with him, right? And it definitely comes out in House of X. Now, if you're not that big into Jonathan Hickman's stuff, then maybe this book is not going to be for you. But if you're a fan of Hickman's work, even work like East of West, Hicks, he's the master of world building, and he's rebuilt the world of the X-Men in House of X number one. And he did it in just the first few pages, and he did it in such an amazing way, especially aided with Pepe Larraz's artwork. The artwork is splendid. It's fantastic. It's big. It's majestic. It's exactly what comic books should be. This feels big. It feels like an event. And it totally is a game-changing status quo shift for mutants in the Marvel Universe who really, to be honest, at least in my opinion, since the whole House of M days and all that stuff, it's kind of been rough for the mutants in the Marvel Universe, and it's been even rougher at times for the X fans. But I think we have reason to rejoice. Lots of things from X-Men history are thrown into this to create something fresh, new, big, bold, daring, and different. Seriously, this when they, when they, they were not lying or selling you short when they were saying... This is the biggest book since, like, Grant Morrison's New X-Men, since Age of Apocalypse, since X-Men number one by Jim Lee and Chris Claremont, right? They are not kidding. This book is redefining for the X-Men. I absolutely loved it. I cannot wait to see how this unfolds and what's to come. House of X number one is out this week, and it's the pick of the week. So there you go. Other books from Marvel this week. Jane Foster, Valkyrie, number one. So Jane Foster is now Valkyrie as of the end of the events of War of the Realms, and she's also the only Valkyrie, so she's got the all-weapon. Really cool. I like this setup. I like seeing Jane Foster back in that heroic role. We just had the recent news at San Diego that in Thor, Love and Thunder, which is the Thor 4 movie, that... Jane Foster is going to be Thor in it. So that's really, really exciting. This is kind of like a nice throwback to that. It's written by Jason Aaron with help by Al Ewing. It's got artwork by Kafu and Jesus Arbatov on the coloring. The art is great. It's big. It's epic. Um, it's clear. It's distinct. It's clean. I really, really like the artwork. The colors shine. They add dimension to the artwork. I really like the story. If you really enjoy Jane Foster's time as the Mighty Thor, I think you're really going to dig this book. If you didn't really like her time as Thor... You're probably not going to like this book, but I really did like it. I thought it was super solid. I like the new status quo for Jane Foster in the Marvel Universe right now, and I thought this was a great first issue that took everything I loved about her time as the Mighty Thor and just kind of kept it going on, but without Mjolnir this time, right? Really cool, fun stuff. I liked it, and it has a nice 
fun um, anchor into some goofy aspects of the Marvel Universe. Speaking of the Marvel Universe, History of the Marvel Universe number one is here, and this book is awesome. I love it. It's written by Mark Wade. It's got artwork by Javier Rodriguez. The artist, the artwork by Javier Rodriguez, by the way, inked by Alvaro Lopez. Um, the, it is the highlight of the book. It's exceptional. This is the artist who's recently on that most recent, most recent, recently, Exiles book. Really great artwork, and it is exactly what the title of the book tells you. It's the history of the Marvel Universe. It has a great framing sequence of how the how and why the story is being told. That it does involve Galactus. Um, not going to really spoil that bit right now, but I really liked it. It's really meticulous. It's detailed. It's rich. It's seriously a woven together thread of the history of the Marvel Universe, starting at the Big Bang, and this leads us up nearing the advent of uh, the, the the Marvel heroes like Captain America, Namor. And, uh, you know, Human Torch and all that stuff, right? I love the artwork. I love those pop-in colors. I love those great um, um, layouts, some great composition. And Mark Way just knows his stuff. And one of the things that's really cool about this book, aside from just the book itself, is at the end there's all these annotations about where they pulled this information from, where it was first revealed. Some things that maybe I didn't even know. Really makes a nice seamless tapestry of the history, and especially the cosmic history in the first issue, of the Marvel Universe. If you've ever been interested or just wanted some clarification, check this book out. It is literally nothing but exposition, but the artwork, it's gorgeous to look out, those layouts, that composition, those colors, it's bright, it's bold, and seriously, it's meticulous as hell. It really goes over a lot of information, very meticulously. So that's the word for that one. Anyway, Web of Venom is back with Funeral Pyre. I really like the callback to the old school Punisher Venom series, Funeral Pyre. We covered that on Comics Revisited. Had a lot of fun going back to my child days and uh, checking that one out. Anyway, that character, Funeral Pilot, does not exist or does not appear in this book, I should say. It does involve um, Maniac, though. So if you're a fan of her, she was the person who got the symbiote during Cullen Bunn's Flash Thompson Venom run. So it's a lot of callbacks to that. But this could very well be called Absolute Carnage the Prelude. It could be Absolute Carnage number zero. Straight up, if you're going to get Absolute Carnage, if you're going to follow that story, you definitely want to read this issue. It's kind of like the first shot in the war that is Absolute Carnage. I really liked it. It's written by Cullen Bunn with artist uh, Joshua Cassara, Alberto Albuquerque. I like the art. I like the story. Um, if you don't know who Maniac is, you will totally be caught up, thrown right into it, has a lot of fun, and like I said, this could very well just be called Absolute Carnage number zero. It probably sell more copies, but don't miss out, especially that Declan Shalvey cover. Fantastic. Fearless number one is here. It's the first part of a three-part mini-series. It's going to focus on some of the women of the Marvel Universe. So the main story basically involves Invisible Woman, Captain Marvel, and Storms. Then it was interesting. It was okay, but nothing really hooked me back. I wanted to come back. Then there's a Millie the Model story, and then there's a tiny little two-page goofy thing in the back by Kelly Thompson. That was pretty fun. So it's a nice celebration of some of the women in Marvel and their place in the history of Marvel and, of course, the future of Marvel. But overall, didn't really do much to thrill me or bring me, like hook me in to want to see what's going to happen in the main stories, but it was cool seeing some of those backup stories, some of those characters like Millie the Model, seeing her reappearance. They should utilize that character more in some way. Anyway, Fearless number one is out this week. Swordmaster number one is here. It's a new book that if you don't know anything about this character, you're going to be a little bit confused, but it does a great job of catching you up. I don't know where the Swordmaster origin stuff started. Was it in Agents of Atlas or New Agents of Atlas? I didn't read that. Was it in one of the Korean produced con I don't I don't really know much of the backstory of Swordmaster right now, but it was decent. It was an okay story. Nice introduction to the world and the concept of what's going on. This kid has this magical sword that his dad just mysteriously disappears and leaves him this sword, right? And there's a lot of mystery about it behind it. But the art is really, really cool by Gunshi. The art is great. It's got a I wouldn't, I mean, I would say manga influence is probably a manga artist. I'm not sure. I'm not familiar with the work, but I really do like it. Greg Pak comes in for the adaptations. This is something that was originally produced, I believe, in the Asian market over there. Um, really did like it. Thought it was cool. Like, nice dynamic artwork, but I don't know if anything really hooked me in to really make me feel like I need to come back and check out the one. But like Arrow before, it was really cool to see a different art style into the Marvel Universe. We've obviously seen that before. It was a big resurgence of it back in the 2000s. But Swordmaster number one was kind of neat. An interesting new character, but I really liked, thought the art was the spotlight on that book. Marvel's The Epilogue is here 25 years later, right? Anyway, this book is just a, it's a, it's a tiny little thing, right? So if you're a huge fan of 
Kurt Busiek and Alex Ross's Marvels from back in the day, like I am, like Jelani is, part of the PCP crew. So definitely that's why we're picking Marvels as our first episode for Comics Revisited, Season 2, which starts August 1st, so be on the lookout for that. Anyway, this nice little epilogue, it's a 16-page story that is, is illustrated by Alex Ross, and it is written by Kurt Busiek, and it does feature the X-Men, so some characters that you didn't quite get to see in Marvels, like Banshee and Wolverine and Jean and whatnot. You, well, you see Jean. In, in Marvels, actually. But like Wolverine and Banshee and Storm, right? There's a great, powerful Storm moment here. So it's nice to see those characters get represented. And it also has annotations in the back, just like the Marvels annotated did, so it makes a nice companion piece to that. If you're a Marvels fan, I don't see why you wouldn't want to pick it up just to see some new pages of Alex Ross artwork. But it is a nice um, epilogue to the story that's set between like issues two and three or something of Eye of the Camera. So, really cool treat for Marvel's fans. Um, Guardians, Guardians, not Guardians. Guardians of the Galaxy number seven is here. Starts the new story, Faithless. Donny Case is joined by Corey Smith and David Curiel on the artwork. The art is fine. If you were really digging Jeff Shaw's style in the first arc, it really is kind of a seamless transition into it. A different style, still distinctive, but it does fit that tone and that flow that kind of was already established by Shaw and Cates in this book. So this story is going to address what we've all been asking since the start of this relaunch. What has happened to Rocket? Where's Rocket? What's going on? Well, you get a little bit of information in this one, but it's mostly the setup to a new story that's really promising, really cool. And to be honest, I thought the first chapter of Arc 2 was better than the first chapter of Arc 1. But I really liked it. Donny Cates is really starting to iron out his characterizations of characters like Star-Lord and Moondragon and a few others. A little bit of nice moments here and there in the book. I do like the artwork. I do like the setup to the story. And the ending is very, very hooking. I will definitely be back for more on that one. The Amazing Spider-Man number 26 is here. A fantastic issue by Nick Spencer. This book had been wearing thin on me a little bit lately, especially because the e of the elongated haunted story. And then this whole new villain thing, and it's just like the disappointment to me of issue number 25, which was this huge story that just, to me, didn't really feel huge or anything like that. Not, I don't know, right? I really like this. This is exactly what I was expecting from Nick Spencer doing Spider-Man. So if you were like his Superior Foes book, you'll really like this one. Nice spotlight on Boomerang. I like getting back to that whole thing about Boomerang is Peter's roommate now, and they're kind of bonding. They're kind of developing a friendship, and that's interesting. We got a new um, Sinister Syndicate around. Um, I really like that. Thought it was a fun little introduction into the, uh, into the book. Really like this story. It's got artwork by Kev Walker. It's pretty solid, well-defined. Um, it's got a lot of gravity to it. Does its job, does a great job of being a fun, entertaining Spider-Man book. And I think after the, the excessiveness of the hunted story, we deserve some fun, light, yet serious reading. Like Amazing Spider-Man number 26. Great issue. Absolutely loved it. Let's jump over to DC Comics. Batman Curse of the White Knight is here. Sean Murphy, Matt Hollingsworth returning to the White Knight world. White Knight was a real fun book. I really enjoyed it. Kind of taking the idea of the Batman and Joker and switching it. What if Joker was the good guy? What if Batman was the bad guy, right? Well, now that everything has been course corrected again, we get a new chapter where the Joker is straight up the Joker. And now we add in Azrael to the situation. So really cool stuff. Lots of neat backstory about Azrael, about the Wayne family, about Gotham is revealed in here. This is now officially DC Black Label. So it does have some cursing in it, but it's real fun. It's gritty. It's hard edged. I love this world of Batman. It takes a lot of different influences. This isn't set in main continuity, but I still love this book. I love Murphy's artwork. It's gritty. It's textured. It's architecturally beautiful. Great composition. The, colorings by, the coloring by Hollinsworth is just bleak, atmospheric, moody. It sets a great tone for this book. I really liked it. It is not anything like the story of White Knight. It does something different, but it does it in that same world, kind of with the same feel, the same atmosphere. Batman Curse of the White Knight was awesome. Asriel fans, you're going to flip. <clears throat> Some real cool stuff there. Detective Comics 1008 is out this week. It's the return of the Joker into the pages of Detective Comics. So really excited to check out this issue because the Joker is featured. It's Peter, it's Peter Tomasi back with Doug Monkey on the artwork. Really excited to see what's going to happen. I really loved the first story arc mythology of Detective Comics that Tomasi and Monkey did. Um, I thought the second arc with Arkham Knight was kind of weak and the Spectre story was a little uneven. It was all right. This is a pretty fun, interesting little thing. It's got some, 
It's got some moments in there I'm like, I don't know if that would exactly happen that way, but the art was great, detailed, the great, great uh, characterization of the Joker. I like the interplay with him and Batman. And it also does have a bit with the offer, and the offer is made, if you look at the variant cover, which I don't have, to Mr. Freeze. Anyway, lots of cool, interesting things happening in here. A nice one-shot story. And it's kind of cool to see Joker kind of have a moment to reflect on being kicked out of the Legion of Doom, in a way. And torment Batman and Gotham at the same time. Detective Comics 1008, out this week. I did check out some of the other variant covers, though. We got more of those Year of the Villain cardstock covers. There are three that I think are some of the hypest of the, the whole run yet, like some of the best ones. First of all, Justice League Dark number 13, that Cersei variant. <clears throat> That's awesome. That looks fantastic. Justice League Dark number 13 is great. Start of a new story, kind of shining a spotlight a little bit on uh, Kent Nelson, um, Dr. Fate, a little bit on his backstory, his origin. If you never knew it, now you will. I um, really like that bit. It has another story in here that involves Satana and Constantine having com a conversation about, uh, about some of the recent revelations that Tinian has made in this book. James Tinian has been doing a great job on this one. You got Mark Buckingham, and you also have... Dun, 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 dun. Daniel St. Pierre doing the artwork on this. Fantastic stuff. Really like the artwork. I'm loving Justice League Dark. It's doing some great work for the, the underbelly of the Dark uh, universe in the DC, right? The, the magic side, things like that. Anyway, really did like this book. It's also got another little bit in the offer, so you definitely want to check that out if you're following all of that stuff. Justice League Dark's been amazing. I'm really liking where the story's going, and it's filled with mystery and intrigue right now. Great stuff. Actually, Comics 1013 was an okay issue. It's starting to wear thin on me. The Ben to Superman run. I do think a reread is in, is in, is definitely, it's time for a reread. Definitely. Because sometimes I hit a point where I'm like, I'm starting to get bored. I'm starting to get kind of just not so into the book. And may sometimes just going back and rereading it all together will kind of like shine a new light on things or just shake things up for you a little bit. But this, this book is just not doing much for me anymore. It's barely got any Superman in it. I feel like this whole event Leviathan thing is, is bloated. I feel like all of Bendis' Superman stories are just this one bloat, like two stories that are getting bloated out into the thinnest stretched out little plots. I'm just not digging it anymore. But I do love that Frank Quitely Lex Luthor cover. <clears throat> really cool stuff. Another cover, probably cover of the week. Flash number 75, that's the year of the villain Francis Manipool cardstock cover. That cover is great. This book is the finale of Flash Year One, which I do think is a was a really fun story. I really enjoyed it. Really like how it ties into the present day stuff that's going on. This also has three stories in it. The end of year one, the part where it kind of ties some things into what's going on right now, and then the offer that's made to Captain Cold by Lex Luthor, right? So another offer bit in the pages of Flash number 75. Really crackling high energy artwork, especially the Howard Porter stuff. A nice satisfying conclusion to Flash year one. And I really like, this has been the best turtle story I've ever read. There you go. Freedom Fighters returns with issue number seven. Eddie Barros is not on the artwork anymore. Instead, we have Bruno Redondo and Adriano Lucas on the coloring. The art is great. It's a completely different style, but it kind of fits because the story kind of slows up a little bit. Those first six issues were very bombastic, very loud, very fast, very high octane energy. This one's a little bit more slow a little bit more claustrophobic, a little bit more confined, a little bit more restricted. And the art change actually helps accentuate that fact about the tone of the story. I really like this book. Freedom Fighters is set in an alternate reality DC Universe type thing. Uncle Sam is there. Who's the traitor as the cover proposes right there? You find out in this book. I'm loving it. Freedom Fighters is out this week. Dial H for Hero number five is here. This is the best issue of this one yet. Very meta, very explainy. Um, have you ever heard the hero verse? This explains what the hero verse is, the origins. Like I said, it gets really meta, gets really cool in its theory and its concept and its idea. Really like that stuff. Sam Humphreys is doing a great job on that one. Joe Canones is doing a great job on the art, being able to switch styles back and forth to make it fit the tone of what exactly hero is supposed to be being uh, invoked or whatever at that moment from the H dial. I really like this book. It's so much fun. The Wonder Comics line is solid. Fantastic stuff. Dial H for Hero number five out this week. You don't want to miss it. We got a new one from IDW this week called Star Pig. I don't even remember 
if I even saw solicitations for this or anything, but I saw it and I was like, well, that's neat. It kind of looks like a Lisa Frank Trapper Keeper on the cover. So yeah, I'll check it out. This was really cool. Sleeper Head of the Week type stuff. Really liked it. It's basically about this young lady who's lost in space and she gets saved by a giant tardigrade. And it's that's exactly it, but it's real fun. It's got this nice sense of adventure to it. Um, it's got a lot of tragedy in it too, but it's able to balance the humor, the, the, the wonder, and the darkness of the story all at once. I really thought they did a fantastic job on this one. In fact, who did it? It's written by Delilah S. Dawson with artwork by Francisco Gaston and colors by Sebastian Chung. The coloring, the artwork, the line work, the composition is great. It's bright. It's exactly what the cover would lead you to believe. I really did like this one. Really cool, interesting new spin on some sci-fi type stuff. But once again, it was just very charming. Great artwork and just an interesting concept. Star Pig number one. <clears throat> Be on the lookout for it. So this one's from American Gothic Press. Monster World, The Golden Age, number one. So I decided I'd check it out. I realized that it's got ties to Famous Monsters, the magazine, so that's kind of cool. I don't think I've ever read anything from this. This is written by Philip Kim, Holly Interlandy, with artwork by Peter Kowalski. Kowalski. Um, I was actually really, really surprised by this one. So straight up, this issue is all exposition. All this issue does is set up the world that this story is going to take place in. And it does it by someone telling you. It's just the writer is telling you what's happened. That's pretty much the whole issue. So aside from it being bogged down because of that, the lore, the idea, the world building, it's really intriguing. I really liked it. I liked the artwork. Really liked it. It's very textured at times, very loose when it needs to be at times. And like I said, it tells this history of this monster world that the story is going to be set in. And it was really engaging. And I really liked it. So Monster World of the Golden Age, you might want to be on the lookout for that. If you're a fan of old school horror stuff like I am, I think you should check it out. Ascender number four is here from Image Comics. Um, Dustin Wynn, Jeff Lemire continuing on the story um, left over from Descender 10 years later. Now it's magic, not sci-fi, a little bit more fantasy based, but still just as fun, just as powerful, just as moving, just as beautiful to look at. Ascender is such a great successor to Descender, a completely different story, but the same feel, the same tone, that same beautiful, luscious artwork. Beautiful stuff. I'm loving this book so much. It's got some great concepts in it, some striking composition. Really loving Ascender. Jeff Lemire is just on the top of his game right now. Ascender number four is an example of that out this week. Also from Image, we've got Middle West number nine. This is seriously my favorite Scotty Young book I've ever read. It's got artwork by Jorge Corona. Jean Francois Below on the coloring. Really like this book. It's fun. It's a nice fantasy book about a kid running away from his abusive father in that little bit of his abusive father that he feels is inside of him, right? And a nice, fun fantasy tale that is starting to get dark, starting to get very serious. Um, um, the stakes are getting higher and a lot more explaining is getting done, a lot more lore is being introduced about this world of Middle West. And it's exciting and it's fun and it's such an adventure to discover the world of Middle West along with the characters in this book. I love it. Great artwork, a great story, great characters, and a nice resonating um, uh, deeply nuanced story that will pretty much resonate with anybody. Middle West number nine is out this week. Farmhand number 10 is out this week. This concludes the second arc of Farmhand. Rob Guillory's great weird fantasy type tale of this dude who learned how he could grow human organs as if they were vegetation, right? And of course it can't be as simple as that. It's got to get crazier and crazier and crazier. But what's really striking about this book is that the core of the book is not that awesome concept alone that will hook you in, but it's the family. It's the characters. It's the emotion. It's anchored and grounded with some really meaty characters, with some great interaction, some nice human drama in the midst of this crazy, weird, fun, and at times doesn't take itself too seriously, but just seriously enough. Farmhand number 10 is an excellent end and conclusion to the second arc. I cannot wait to see what happens in arc three. Lots of questions to be answered and lots of fun to be had. Farmhand number 10 out this week. Also from Image Comics, Redneck number 22. Donny Cates loves him some vampires. I just recently uh, read Interceptor for the first time all the way through. Loved it. Dude loves vampires. I love vampires. The Donny Cates vampire book. Pfft, there you go. Redneck. It's about vampires uh, that live in Texas, right? But now the story's gone a lot beyond on that. We've kind of had uh, the redneck version of the Red Wedding, and we are now in that post-world. Lots of pieces are broken. They're slowly starting to be put back together. I'm loving this book. I love the artwork by Lissandro Estrin and Dee Cuniff on the coloring. 
fantastic stuff. Um, some nice twists and turns with the characters in this. This book gets ramped up every single issue. Each arc gets more intense. Donnie Cates and company doing a great job with Redneck. Out this week with issue number 22. Mighty Morphin Power Rangers number 41 continuing the necessary evil story. We are now in the timeline of the White Ranger, which would be exciting enough, but there were revelations in the last issue, the first part of this story, about what exactly Jason Trini and Zack went off to do when they became peace ambassadors, and it's much more than we thought, much more beneath, uh, more, it's much more beneath the eye? Did I almost say that? Danielle D. Niculo doing a great job on the artwork, very dynamic, um, action-packed, Really great coloring on there as well. Ryan Parrott doing, doing a fantastic job. This book was waning on me at the end of Shattered Grid. I haven't really been paying too much attention to it. Now you got these new foil covers. You're introducing the White Ranger in. You're telling these untold stories from the lore of Power Rangers. As a Power Rangers fan, this is the best Power Ranger comic I've ever read. It's fantastic stuff. And that foil cover. Super cool. From Aftershock Comics, we got Killer Groove number three is out this week. Really like this one. It's about this dude living in the 70s post-hippie dream. Um, trying to make a music career work. It doesn't really quite work out. Then all of a sudden he becomes an assassin. And as he's killing people, he starts getting inspired. And it really inspires his music. And now he becomes a little bit of a legitimate rock star, right? So he's an assassin by day. And he's a rock star by night, right? And it's fun. He's in his Killer Groove. But there are a lot more... Um, a lot more pieces to the puzzle that are kind of going around him and moving around and coming together in a very exceptional way. Ollie Masters, um, Eowyn, Marin, Jordi Belair, uh, Hassan Osman El Howe, a fantastic creative team at the top of their game, doing a really great crime fiction book set in 70s LA that really has a, a flair and a tone and an atmosphere appropriate for the time and for the genre that they're telling the story in. Killer Groove, number three, out this week. Don't miss it. And finally, let's talk about Livewire. Livewire, number eight, concludes the second story arc by Vita Ayala. I absolutely love this book. They're doing a fantastic job. Um, the artwork is splendid. The artwork is great. Who is the artist? Who is the artist and why do I not know? I definitely need to look it up. I really like the book. I have never been that into Valiant. Never really paid too much attention to the Harbinger universe or the character of Livewire or anything like that. But in this book, you got nice, clean artwork. You got a really interesting character. You got a writer who's able to handle that character and bring it into social situations that are relevant and make sense. And you got top notch coloring. Why, why can I? Oh, there, it's at the very, it's Cano. It's Cano. Of course, it's Cano. Um, great, simple artwork, a fantastic way to tell the story, brilliant coloring, striking composition, and like I said, great dialogue and great characterizations that intensely hooks me every time I read this book. Livewire number eight is out this week. So that's what I read. That's what I thought about it. I know a lot of y'all are going to be checking out House of X, but do not forget to check out some of these other offerings that are out this week. Lots of excitement in the comic shops. So what are you getting? What are you reading? What do you like? What do you like about it? Let us know in the comments down below. Thank you so much for checking out the video. Please do like, share, and subscribe. Click the notification bell. And join us over at popculturephilosophers.com for podcasts and sometimes a whole lot more. I've been Rockin' Robbie Billups. Thanks for rocking with us. Keep on reading.